has been a usual, I guess, situation. Usually we're doing courses here. Um, but I went to the um, Education Expo and did a little lecture there on um, African-centered education. And it, it reminded me that we need, um, people need a little piece, something to give them an idea about how to think about African-centered education. This is, this is not a curriculum. I'm not going to give you a curriculum. I'm not going to give you a set of, of books to read. But for me, it's very important for people to, to, to think about how they need to think about how they're doing this. And so that's, that's really what this is about. We want to um, start out, I want I want to start out with, the, they say, well, you want the good news or you want the bad news? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start out with the bad news, and we're going to try to get through this fairly quickly, and then we're going to go to um, the good news, and hopefully we can connect the bad news to the, um, to the good news. And this, is, this of course, is a, a lecture about African-centered education. We want to start out with what African-centered education is not and go through this list of what I consider to be the um, most critical factors that distinguish African-centered education from non-African-centered education for African people, African children. Um, and we're not just talking about children, here, even though, of course, children are our focus. We're talking about all of us because in our tradition, education occurred before you were born and it continued after you're gone. Um, I remember talking about the Tasu because I was concerned uh, about the buildup of, of um, negative forces. If we're, if we're at war, then it's not just a physical war, it's not just a mental war, it's also a spiritual war. So I was a little curious, not knowing very much about it, I was asking him um, if. A lot of, if, if all Europeans who are going there are trying to destroy us, and the Negroes who are supposed to be with us are also transitioning and going to join that, isn't the spiritual side of this war um, balancing in their favor? And he said, yes it is. He said, but we have a responsibility to teach our ancestors, to teach the folks who have passed on. We have a responsibility to continue to learn and to pass on what we know to them. So that, I guess, made things a little clearer for me. When we talk about what African-centered education is not, it is not hostage theory. A lot of us believe that if you can just get our children in the presence of European children, of children who are supposed to be more intelligent, then somehow that will rub off, sort of like uh, learning by osmosis where you can just lay on the pillow, and if the book's underneath it, somehow it'll get absorbed into your head even if you don't read it. But just to be able to sit beside them somehow gives our children an advantage. And that, of course, we should know that this is a lie. What's, what is, um, I guess what makes it um, not easier to see, but important for us to understand our power, what we were able to do in terms of our education, we had nothing. When the books that we received in the schools were fourth, fifth, sixth generation throwaways that we were able to collect. When we were working on bits and pieces of slate that someone found and using a piece of chalk that we had found or made up or rock to write. And the children learned beyond anybody else. And now we have children who have the best equipment in the world. And we're having trouble teaching them. We're having trouble with them getting an education. So it's not the tool, it's not who they're with or who they're around or what kind of equipment they got. It has to do with how they're being taught and what they're being taught and why they're being taught. That's one of the questions we often don't ask, why they're being taught. And most of our scholars talk about the fact that we have to make sure that they understand that they're supposed to be nation builders. You give a child a mission, if, if these are our geniuses and nothing is beyond them, which is true, I say, if they are, then we ought to be able to give them the mission of making African people sovereign. And they should be able to go do that because they are that powerful. But if they don't have that mission, if they don't have that vision, if the vision they don't have that understanding, then why would they pursue that? They're going to pursue the same individualized thing that everybody else is. We have to give them something that is worth their genius. So the hostage theory should not work for us. It does not work for us, only in our imagination. African centered education is not sub integration focused. Integration is supposed to be the idea that you, um, to, you you're going to be uh, 
that you're going to come together with somebody else and you're going to, you're going to create something better. The, the, part of the problem with that is that um, when, when people want to be um, integrated with something else, they always want to be integrated with something that's better than them or has something that they need. That's, that's logical. And so, so this is the goal. The problem for us with the idea that that was better and also with the um, um, idea that everything that came with that was something that we needed. So we took the negativity with the positivity and we brought that into ourselves and we created something in ourselves that we thought was better because we were imitating them. But that wasn't what it was about. The truth is that we were self-integrated into European culture and society. And that there wasn't this equal playing field, this equal meeting, this coming together and, and everybody bringing the best of, of everything together. We were brought in intentionally at a level that kept us at a place below them. And that kept us inferior. And because of our desire to be loved and appreciated and validated by them, we took that as equality. So as Amos Wilson would say, we, because we have the same things as they do, or we think that we have the same things that we do, somehow we equate that with equality. Okay. The main variable that we're not equal on is the variable of power. Right. That's the main variable. Okay. And that, that is like the difference between income and wealth. With income, people are going to have somewhat similar incomes. The difference isn't going to be all that major, even though it's still dramatic in terms of us and them. But the difference in terms of wealth, which is where real power is in a capitalist system, capital meaning wealth, the, major, the difference there is not even fathomable. The difference is so great. And we're confused because we work for them, so we think that because we work for Ford Motor Company or whoever, we think that that's, that's ours, that we own it. That if it fell apart tomorrow, that they would divvy it up and we get our share. <laughs> so we remain very sub-integration. That's the vast majority of us being accepted by them being incorporated into their machine, getting our share of the graft of what they have stolen from other people, including ourselves. We want a bigger share, we want a bigger piece of the pie. The pie is stolen. Okay? The pie had, has people's blood on it from the people who were destroyed, who are removed forever from existence. And we want a bigger piece of that without having to deal with the morality or the ethics of it. We want a bigger piece of what Europeans have stolen from the world. That's our goal. That goal should not be passed on to our children. Next, Urugu front and center. When I was a young man, which wasn't that long ago, but when I was a young man, I remember the parents in Philadelphia, in DC, in New York, in New Jersey, fighting so hard to get white teachers from in front of their children. Because they understood the connection between that teacher and the student's perception of power. They understood that clearly. It didn't make a difference where they understood that clearly. But now, because of this we're all human thing, they're coming back. A study just came out last week talking about the number of teachers in our classrooms who do not look like our children. And many studies in the 70s and 80s show that children learn best from people who are of the same race, who have this, are this pretty much the same, same socioeconomic status, live in their communities with them. They learn better from these people. And now we're allowing this reversal because we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten what we fought for. Even the children back then. I remember us doing a, a strike in the cafeteria because the principal was white. We <laughs> tore that school up, Taft Junior High School. We tore the school up. Within a week, he was gone. And even though it really didn't do a whole lot for us in terms of the <laughs> classroom, for us it did something, you know. Okay? It did something. And they're returning, going to any of these schools. We're going to talk about gender confusion, but just Urugu in the front of our children. The, the understanding of power subconsciously in the child's mind hasn't changed. It's still the same. And we're trying to pretend that it, that it has not changed. Black first. This is, people have pet peeves. That's one of my pet peeves. Whenever I hear the first black or the black first, this is, this is such a um, warped mentality for people who um, want to be sovereign. Or maybe that's my error. 
maybe we don't want to be sovereign. Maybe that's, that's the error that I have. But whenever we say this, we say that we are less than them. Whenever we're saying this, we're saying that they are superior. We finally got to a point where we did something that they have already done, are good at, finished with. So the first this, or the first black to do this, or the first black to reset, or the first black to do this, that's really got nothing to do with the fact that we have created so many things on our own, within their context. But we glorify black first. We turn that into a phenomenon that needs to be worshipped. We push our children to become black first, as if we're trying to get them to change their opinion about us. By proving to them that we're as good as they are. Who are they to be as good as? Who are they to compare with? As scholars have told us, if we want to talk about our greatness, then we need to look compare where we're at now to when we were great. Then we'll see how little progress we have made. Not to say that we haven't made progress, not to say that we're not as strong or stronger, but to compare ourselves with ourselves. Not to compare ourselves with lesser gods, to compare ourselves with ourselves. So we should be talking black first. We absolutely should not be talking black first, especially not to our children. We can talk about what whoever uh, made this or created that or built this or what have you, but it shouldn't be in the context of black first. We're already there. Rope memorization. This is another one of my, I guess, pet peeves. Uh, when I was growing up. The emphasis was on making your child think better. My mother would drive my brother and I crazy sometimes when we would ask her something and she would ask it back. I remember, I remember the one I guess maybe it was so traumatic for my brother. We were at an airport. He wanted to be learn how to fly, and he eventually did. Um, and he asked, he turned around, and I'm three years younger than him. He asked, Mom, what happens if a, if a plane lands upside down? And I could, my father, I could see my father going. <laughs> I, I could see him, and she turned around and she looked at him and she said, tell me, what happens if a plane lands upside down? And he knew he was cornered because he had to come up with something logical, even if it was wrong. It had to be a thought out, logical answer. Okay? That was how we were brought up. To learn how to think. think is a, thinking is a skill. Something that you have to practice is something that has to be mastered. I talked to the students, I said, this is a muscle. It has to be exercised in order to get better. So sometimes in class, uh, like today, we were looking at the maps, and they were using the, the coordinates to find certain locations. And every once in a while, I would question a student in terms of what they found. They said, oh, this is Brazil. And I said, and I give that authoritative teacher, Brazil, that's, what do you mean that's Brazil? You need to look again. And he'd look again. It's Brazil. No, it's not Brazil. And the third time, I said, yeah, you're right. But he had done all of that exercise with his mind. That's how we get smarter. That's how we learn how to think. And we're giving our children answers. We're not making them be think creatively. So they, they receive a toy now that's one piece versus having to figure out how to put this bad boy together. Running interference with them so they aren't, don't receive the challenges that the mind needs to grow, to develop, to become strong. We are doing them a dis disfavor. We are weakening them by making them take pride in Things that they can memorize and just regurgitate, just give back that rote memorization. So I said, now the smartest child in the classroom is not the one who can think the best, it's the one who has the best memory. That's the smartest child now, not the one that can think the best. And this, the, the studies that I have seen show that those who think the best, especially when you're talking about schools in our neighborhoods, they're the ones most likely to drop out because they can't right. deal with non thinking environments. Mm -hmm. They can't deal with being pigeonholed into these little, you know, squares that don't reflect their genius. But they, are they bored? Yes, they're bored to death. And they have, they have no idea why. And they have no idea why they're not made to think, why they're not made to challenge. And it's, it's interesting, sometimes we will get uh, students here, it's not the norm, but sometimes we'll get students here who are brought up in that rote memorization environment and um, they will give an answer to whatever, and any of will say, well, why? Or how does that happen? And they're like, what kind of question is that? I gave you an answer. Why, why do you need me to do any more? I gave you the answer, like on the test. Why do I need to think? They figure it out after a while. 
but having to think is something that is is almost passe. That's that's the mind of, of, of slaves. If you can't think, you can't build anything. How are you going to build a nation? How are you going to build a family when things get difficult if you can't think? How are you going to build a house from scratch? How are you going to go to farm when there's no manual there for you to do it? You have to be able to think. And we're taking that away from our children in all areas. I'm going to skip gain influence because that really works in with some of the other ones. Um, African Center education is not about getting a job. If anything, it's about creating, teaching our children to create, to build on their own, and to be able to deal with the difficulty of having to start from scratch. It's not easy. That requires some intestinal fortitude. That requires some inner strength to be able to build from scratch and to know that you're going to win if you just hang in there long enough, that you're going to succeed. Well, they're saying that black folks tend to quit. That's funny. What's that? I forget who they were. Black folks tend to quit right before they've won. Right before they won, mm. they tend to quit. That's, that's, that's sad. So we're not about maybe making jobs for our people. We're not about getting a job so you can increase someone else's income or someone else's wealth. It's about making jobs for yourself and for others. And that requires that Columba, that creativity to be nurtured in our children. They need to start this out young, even though, of course, they will be not coddled, they will be um, supported by people in the community who, if this product was made by an adult, they wouldn't buy it. But they need to have the experience of trying and seeing how people respond to what they do, whatever it is. Whatever the talent is, it's sellable. They need to understand the importance of us buying from each other. What, uh, one trillion dollars and less than 4% of our monies goes to black businesses? That needs to be reversed, and that's a thinking problem. Amos Wilson said, an economy is a set of relationships between people. Exactly. It's not currency. Mm -hmm. It's how we relate to each other, how we see each other. Production, distribution, consumption, how we see what we're supposed to do with that. That's a mentality. That has to be taught. Okay. That's the band. Now, let's talk about the good. of sovereignty. Sovereignty means that you control everything. Everything was in your power. Economics, family, politics, culture, everything is under your control. No one else has anything that you need. They may have a few things that you want, but no one else should have anything that you need to survive. That's sovereignty. You control. You dictate the politics. You make the final say. You do things in your interest, in the interest of your children. And you do not allow anyone to interfere with that. Anyone. That's sovereignty. That's power. That's power. And people are nothing without power. What was the quote? Um, Zuri? Is he in there? Johnny. Zuri. What was that quote about Garvey and power from this morning? When you find it, Brother Zuri, let me know. Okay. Educational sovereignty. We control, this is a diagram, we control input, throughput, and output. We control all of this. This is bureaucratic organization model. We control everything. Raw materials, the processing of those materials, the finished product, distribution, who gets it, who doesn't get it, how much who gets. We're supposed to control all of it. That's sovereignty. So, let me write from this little chart right here. Anya, he found it. What does it say? Power is the only agreement, argument that satisfies man. Power is the only argument that satisfies man. Power is the only argument that satisfies man. Garvey. Garvey is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Garvey is brilliant. Madassi? 
So this is the education variable. Input would be students, educators, and institutions. Basic, fundamental, but all these, of course, should be African. Throughput, what happens in the process? Disciplining, nation building, education. Discipline, disciplining, focusing, honing on the idea of sovereignty. You're not educating for game, you're only educating because we're trying to build a nation. Everybody else is trying to build a nation, we're trying to play. What did the, uh, I guess maybe children need to cover the ears or this one. What did he say? We're, we're busy looking at blank and they're busy building underground cities. Yeah, that's just mind boggling to me. It showed pictures of, of um, black children booty shaking and white children mm -hmm. at the gun range. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I have, a, I have a picture. Yes, absolutely. Yes. There's a lot of females in that picture, too. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Almost all of the girls, that were, almost all the people at the range were little girl, white girls. And we're, we're, we're playing. We're worrying about hair. We're worried about our car. We're worried about what our lawn looks like. We're worried about um, what restaurant. We're worried about our job. We're worried about our credentials. While well, people are preparing to remove us from existence. Anybody been keeping track of gun sales over the last 30 years? There are 900 gun manufacturers in this country alone. We're not ready. We're not ready. That's not an excuse, but we're not ready. We better get ready. Because they learned from the last time. And they don't make the same mistake twice. Output. Visionary. Knowledgeable. Thinkers. Because there may only be one left. And that one thinker needs to be, well, it needs to be two, because you got to have the man and the woman. <laughs> Because they might have to build from scratch by themselves. And that should be the mission of the parent teacher, the parent educator. I want to give my child or my children everything they need to build African from scratch. All of the disciplines, engineering, everything that they need to build from scratch. So everything that I do, my child should be involved in. I'm, sitting, I'm changing the light switch, my child needs to be there. Change the tire, my child needs to be there. If I'm cooking this, if I'm planting that, if I'm constructing this, everything that I do, my child, even if they can't handle the material, they can at least watch because familiarity with it will come in handy one day. Everything that we do, our children need to do. Everything my father did, I watch. My brother would watch. I don't understand why today this is a separation. Somebody else is going to teach your child what they need. Somebody else should augment, should add to what you teach your child what they need. But they should be the primary instructors. Mm -hmm. At all. Okay. Now, I want to change these, but leave them. Chart here. And do a little contrast. Like 50 million hours to talk about this. The, 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 no, let me do this first. Okay, let's talk about African nationalist. Negroes and lost souls, which includes Negroettes, <laughs> and Europeans. 
terms of education, what is the purpose of education? For African nationalists, we should include everybody here, education is learning for liberation. It is intelligence focused. It is, it has an emphasis on thinking. Negroes are lost souls, so education is getting credentials for jobs. It is trivia. has an emphasis on memory. For Yorugu, education is schooling to control others. Thinkers siphoning out the power from the weak ones as much as possible. Of course, some of the thinkers slip through. But the process is to remove any potential threat. And as this European female who wrote about culture said, made, made very clear in her analysis, culture is a defensive mechanism. And European culture is a defensive mechanism. And as Curtis Mayfield said, the hunt is on and you're the prey. So we are the threat. And those who rise, they rise because they are not seen as a threat. And he said, some slip through. Some, some, some slip through. That's a good thing. Some slip through. 